Hello there, you're welcome back to Biology Video Lectures with Akiri Lee Oladimiji Philip. It's my pleasure to have you with me on the lecture today. So today we move on to question, I um, mean past question 2013 on the UTME past question series. So get set and let's get started. The process in which complex substances are broken down into simpler ones is referred to as that is called catabolism. All right, let me explain something to you quickly. What it means is you have a big thing like this, big structure like this, and it's broken down into small ones, like, I mean, just making it smaller, so to say, that is called catabolism. So this breaking down this small one is called catabolism. However, it is still possible that you can actually have these small ones come up together again to form a big one, and that is called anabolism anabolism which is option a but that's our answer anabolism all right now catabolism plus cata anabolism forms what we call metabolism so metabolism is you breaking down and building up basically that's what it means or building up and breaking that either we just do that anabolism which means to build up from simple simpler substances or simple molecules to form complex one as anabolism and breaking down what was complex into simpler ones that's catabolism two of them forms metabolism all right the organ which is sensitive to light in juglena is of course the eye spot this one here it uses that to detect light and move towards the light really because we know that um, I did mention and answer is D that euglena can actually exhibit animal characteristics as well as plant characteristics so when there's light available it's going to photosynthesize why because it has chloroplast all right now when there's no light it's going to feed like a normal heterotroph it's going to feed like an animal by using its pellicle to get get its prey and it has also has gullet and all of that all right now so it uses its eye spots to locate where light is. so once there's a, some sort of light it notices there he notices it then move towards that part to start photosynthesizing all right the organisms present in cells that are actively respiring and photosynthesizing are well respiration means the release of energy from absorbed or digested food so the organelle that does that is mitochondria and photosynthesizing of course is done by what by chloroplasts all right, so we're looking for option that has both of them, and that's option D. So let me bring this to us to remember that, uh, let me just use the plant cell for, for short, that this is chloroplast that contains chlorophyll, all right? And this is the mitochondrion singular that makes energy. So this is um, for photosynthesis, and this is for respiration. Please don't forget that respiration it's not breathing in, please. That's gaseous exchange. Respiration means ability to, or means removal of energy from food. That's what you do in respiration, basically. Teniasolium can be found in. Teniasolium is a type of tapeworm, which is found in pigs. Tenia saginata is found in cow or let's say cattle. So don't forget that. Tenia solum is found in pig. Tenia saginata is found in cow. All right. So this is tenia. Uh, okay. Yes, that's what we're going to say. So this is tenia solium. It has hooks, and tenia saginata doesn't. I think if you've seen my other video, I hope there wasn't a mix-up in this world. Please take note of the correction. Tenia solium is the one that has hooks for attachment what an acidinata does not so this nasodium is found in pork or let's say pigs so to say and this is found in uh, 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 in beef all right or let's say in in cattle so to say like i explained to you so please don't forget the one that has hooks and the one that doesn't have hooks however there's one other particular uh, species again which is not any of these two that also has hooks really all right, but take note of where it is found. Which of the following describe the characteristics of arthropods? Describe the characteristics. Now, the organism finds it easy to grow freely. The organism has a pair. It says a pair of appendages. That 
a means just one and that's not correct the body is not divided into number of segments that is also not correct the body is covered by chitin that made sense so d is the answer see the, the point is they truly have jointed appendages but it's not just one because he's saying a pair that's why b is wrong he says a pair so it's it's that that's wrong so the answer is d so this is what this is one of the examples of arthropods anyway this is an insect that has body segments head okay of course you can see head thorax and abdomen it has jointed appendages like this it has three pairs this particular one has three pairs insect have three pairs like this is one two three and they also have the one two three the, the, the other side too so they, but they have chitin that covers them which gives them some sort of waterproof against them they, 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 they don't they can't absorb water so to say all right that's the function of chitin which of the following distinguishes a butterfly from a moth the wings of butterfly rest horizontally but those of moose rest vertically that information ought to be the other way around so that option is wrong both are active during the day they have similar antenna the abdomen of moot is faster than that of faster than that of butterfly i think i'm going to work with d yes the reason why i said a is wrong is this when butterfly are at rest they hold their wings up that's like vertically so not horizontally as you said in option a well when moot has rest they roll their their wings like almost that's like horizontally like backwards so that is opposite to what is happening here that's why i didn't choose a all right the quill sorry which of the following types of feathers is used for flights and birds it's actually the quill feather probably that's why i said that at the beginning i think mainly i saw that i just knew what the answer was so this is what the quill feather looks like the quill are found majorly at the wings of the bird and at the tail so it helps the bird uh, the bird to, to to glide when they have to do that and also help them to basically it just helps them to stay afloat in the air all right so so that's used for flight basically why these other ones are used to keep them warm so to say phyllo plumes are actually like it looks like it looks almost like hair in in mammals like it's just tiny hair like structures there at the other at the, at, the, at the floor of the body of the animals the plant that grows in desert or very dry areas are referred to as xerophyte all right so xerophyte are the ones that grows in deserts um hydrophyte grows in water habitat like in the ponds and waterlogged area while mesophyte grows on a normal kind of soil while epiphyte is just a plant that finds anchor on another plant it's not a plastic plant anyways it just gets anchor on that plant for light and all of that So this is an example of zero fight here. These are found on a sandy area, so to say. Now, which of the following is the simplest living organism? From what we have here, the simplest will be virus. It's even though it's a confused entity. The answer is B. Why the rest is confused? Because for some reasons, it can be a living thing. And for some reasons, it can also be a non-living thing based on what's available to it. That's all. All right. So that's what we say virus. Virus is not really classified as part of the kingdoms of living things because of the fact that it exhibits a living entity and a non-living entity as well. Proboscis is a structure that, that is mostly found in insects, basically. It's a tube they use to feed and it looks somewhat like this. Yes, this is a proboscis here is found in butterfly most insect that sucks they use that now please don't forget this he said most not all because some insects are biting and chewing like cockroaches those don't have proboscis but the likes of of um butterfly mosquitoes aphid and all of those ones that sucks they definitely use proboscis to it's a tube with which they obtain their food from the plants or the, the organism they live in now the structure adaptation the structure adaptation of desert plants for water conservation is broad leaves with numerous stomata 
that is suicidal. The more leaves you have, the more matter you have, the more you lose water. So that is that, that option is going to be for tropical rainforest kind of plants. Spongy mesophyll, spinous leaves, prominent tomato in leaves. The answer is C. Instead of having a normal kind of leaf, their leaves has been reduced to spines. That's what you're seeing here. So there's no leaf in the first place, let alone have a tomato. So all those spikes, so to say, or spines, so to say, are the ones that it uses. So so that's so it says spiny leaves. So that reduce total no water loss at all. Because if it has leaf, it's going to have stomata. And you don't want to, and water comes out through transpiration through the stomata. I don't want to do that at all. All right. The long and sharp clawed feet of birds and adaptation for what? Well, that would be for it says long and sharp clawed feet of birds. That would be for grasping prey. Yes. So if you look at what we have here, you can pause the video like I always tell you. You can the aim of this kind of video is for you to learn other things other than just the question alone. So we have you see it here. So this is the what we're talking about here. You can see both the the beak, the beak is hooked, and the uh the the, the, the claw is equally clawed to be able to uh, to be able to is sharp and to be able to hold on and to see spray. All right. During the manufacture of food by plants, which are the following organisms use energy from the sun? Okay, now this is, I, I love this. The answer to this question is Anabena. Anabena is a blue-green algae that does two things. It is chemosynthetic and it's also photosynthetic. So chemosynthetic means it can it's it's one of the nitrogen fixing bacteria actually but it also photosynthesizes so it looks like this this is an abena so it is it has two things it does it is used in nitrogen fixation it's also used it's also it carries, carries out uh, uh um, photosynthesis but these other ones are purely um chemosynthetic they don't photosynthesize all right that's why so don't forget that anabinato is also chemosynthetic, but it can equally photosynthesize too. Please don't forget that. It is a nitrogen fixing bacteria and it is a cyanobacteria. I mean, it is um, an algae that can also photosynthesize, so to say. Movement of minerals and chemicals compound with a plant occurs during, I think it's meant to be within a plant, occurs during translocation, which is done by a structure called Phloem, so to say. All right. Translocation is the movement of food substances around the body of the plant. When transpiration is the movement of water through the stomata. All right. So this is what we're saying. This is translocation happening in the phloem. So translocation of sucrose. You can see that here. Translocation of sucrose. All right. The enzyme that is present in the saliva is called tyaline that's option d and what category does it belong to it it's belong it belongs to a category called amylases or amylase meaning that they can digest carbohydrates some book we call them carbohydrates it means the same thing while pepsin is found in the stomach basically to digest protein lipase is found in the small intestine and the pancreas really and or let me say the pancreas really and ren is found in the stomach to color milk. So lipase works on lipids or fat, so to say. But the answer in this question is going to be um tyaline alone, which is option D, which is in the saliva in the mouth, which prefers to work in alkaline medium. All amylases prefer alkaline medium, which the mouth is is or the saliva in the mouth is. Plants that have ability or special devices of trapping and digesting insects are called carnivorous plants. So this is what you have here. This is Venus fly trap. This is sundew. Please hear this. You might want to ask, why would a plant decide to do this? They do it for a reason. Most of these kind of plants grow up in a soil where they don't or in an environment where they don't have nitrogen. Now, don't forget that the body of animals contains proteins 
proteins. So because there's no nitrogen around them, when they kill an animal, the animal has protein. And the structural formula of protein, you have nitrogen in it. So they obtain the nitrogen in the protein that is present in the animal they've killed. That's what they do, actually. That's one of the reasons why they do that. It's not just that they are trying to complement for nitrogen, which they couldn't get from the soil. All right. The process of transforming the chemical energy of cellular fuels into the high energy bonds of ATP in plant is okay chemical energy of cellular fuels into high energy that's respiration don't don't worry about all the whole twisting and all it what it is into high energy a form of energy is simply called what respiration whether it's animal or plant that's what it is all right fungi or fungi are referred to as heterotrophs because they are filamentous no because they lack chlorophyll yes they can't make their own food by themselves or any of that cannot make food by themselves by themselves are called heterotrophs so they can't make food by themselves so they lack chlorophyll that means they are not producers all right and Example of parasitic protozoo is Plasmodium, which causes what? Malaria. All right. So Plasmodium is a parasitic protozoo, while other ones, most of them are free living. All right. Which blood cells are involved in immune response of vertebrates? So you, of course, can see on the screen. I, I normally drop this for you to be able to understand differences. Of course, you know, blood has the following component. It has um, um, platelets for blood clots and white blood cell for uh, immunity, red blood cell to carry gases and all of that. Then plasma is to carry nutrient and waste products and other things, so to say. Now, bear this in mind that this white blood cell is divided into um, what we call the granulocytes, granulocytes, which are made up of, um, coming, made up of, let me get that out, made up of neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. It's also made up of a granulocyte, which means without granules, and those are made up of two monocyte and lymphocytes. So, lymphocyte is the one that is responsible for immunity or immune system. When people have HIV and AIDS and all of that, what has been affected is their lymphocyte. Of course, that one also has lymphocyte also has types. All right, so the answer here is lymphocyte. All right, I only did all those analysis for you to be able to learn all the stuff there. The blood circulatory system of vertebrate consists of the heart, the arteries, the veins, and capillaries. So the answer is going to be A, that's artery, heart, arteries, capillaries, and veins. All right. All these likes of vena cava, vena cava is a type of vein, aorta is a type of artery already. So if you're, if you're picking aorta, that means you've forgotten about other arteries. But when you just pick arteries, it covers all arteries. When you pick veins, it covers all veins, whether it is small or big. So vena cava is a type of vein, superior and inferior vena cava. They're just very large veins, so to say, that enters the heart at the right auricle. Now, a plant tissue that carries water and mineral salts will be the xylem. All right, don't forget to always try to pause the video, attempt the question before listening to my answer and explanations. All right, so that is that. Which of the following helps in the clotting of blood? Well, I think I said that not quite long in one of the questions we've done today in this question, which is platelets, otherwise called thrombocyte. Thrombocyte. Uh, let me say at this point that can you quickly remind um, see the function of red blood cells and white blood cells and plasma. I guess you said red blood cells to carry oxygen or respiratory gases. It also carry carbon dioxide anyways. 
white blood cell provides immunity and plasma carries nutrients and um, some other waste products as it well. All right. The part of the mammalian skin involved in excretion is, well, excretion means the removal of waste products such as sweat. And that sweat gland is what we are, I just circled now. That's the sweat gland. It goes like that. So it's going to be the sweat gland. The sweat gland. Sebaceous glands secrete melanin. Sorry, not melanin, that's a mistake. Secretes oily substance called um, sebum. And that's not a waste product that keeps our skin moist and all of that. So the answer is sweat gland because sweat is a waste product. Which of the following forms about 55% of the volume of blood in humans? You don't want to forget because you remember I just showed you not quite long. That is formed by plasma. In case you've forgotten, see it here. Plasma is 55% of the blood, while red blood cell forms 45%, while the remaining percentage is formed by um, leukocyte and platelet. Which of the following is a waste product of an insect? Insects really are to overcome water shortage, so they remove their waste product in form of something called uric acid. Uric acid. All right. The main structure in vertebrates that supports and protects the body is, well, that would be the skeleton. How do I mean? Most of our bony structures are covering vital organs in the cranium, or let's say in the skull. You have this is the cranium here, the part of the of our skull where the head, where the hair grows, is called the cranium. While the whole bone of the head is called cr it's called skull. So you can say skull is divided into two, into cranium and facial bone as it were. So this cranium is covering the bone. The thorax is covering the heart and the lungs, all right? The spinal cord is enclosed in what? Vertebral colon, which we call backbone. So skeleton helps to protect us really. It protects and also supports for movement and all of that. The chitin in the endoskeleton of many arthropods is strengthened by calcium compounds. That's why it can be hard. The likes of, um, let's say, crabs and um, prawns and all of that. So these ones, their chitin is rather very hard because of it has been reinforced with calcium and some other compounds. That's why it's, it's, it's hard. It doesn't mean cockroaches doesn't have chitin they have, but theirs is not as hard as these ones are because is not added with calcium and other substances. The transfer of pollen grains from the anther to a stigma, please don't mind that spelling, please. Stigma is going to be S T I G M A, is called pollination, please. Pollination. Transfer of pollen grain from a mature anther to a receptive stigma is called pollination. And this pollination can be self or cross. Self-pollination is when, let's, let me do something quickly here. This is a plant that has a flower here. Let me say this is flower one. This is another flower two. Just follow what I'm going to do. If the anther, so if the pollen grain moves from this anther, let me put A, to this stigma here, that's self-pollination. If this pollen grain from this anther moves to the stigma on this second flower is still called self-pollination self -pollination because it is still on the same plant. However, if, let's say, the anther from this plant, or this anther, uh, from this, uh, the pollen grain from this anther moves to fertilize the stigma on another flower of the same species of, the, of plant. Let's say this is mango flower. This also mango flower, that is cross-pollination. It has to be the same species. However, it once it moves to another plant, it's now called cross-pollination. All right, so that's why we have what we have here. Of course, we know that what we are seeing on the screen here is talking about um, agent of pollination, which insects are. Agent of pollination are usually insect and wind. And plants, flowers that are pollinated by insects are called entomophilous flower. Ento 
flowers. While the ones that are pollinated by wind are called anemophilous flowers. All right. Then aside this, we have some other ones that are pollinated by water. We call those ones hydrophilous. And we have those that are pollinated by animals. We call those ones zoto. Philos. It's just things you need to remember. Now, please don't be careful. Somebody once asked me, why do you say zootophilos and you also said um, entomophilos, which, which that is insect, uh, insect, not animals. What we mean by zootophilos, we are talking about bigger animals and not insects, like flies. Sorry, not like flies, like birds. We have some birds, hummingbirds that suck nectar. Those ones we also help to pollinate and those ones are categorized as zootophilos. Those ones are birds. But the likes of insects, bees, wasps, butterfly, those ones are entomophilus. So this is insect, this is wind, this is water, this is animals. All right. The male reproductive organ of a flower is the stamen, otherwise called androsium. It can also be called and O E C O N is D R O E, please. All right. Now, the best way I normally find a way to remember is the M E N D stamen. Y carpel is the female part of the flower. So I think we can see that here. And uh, okay, this is the stamen here, made up of what? Anther that contains pollen grain and filament that holds the anther in position. So this is carpel here. This one in the middle here is the carpel that's made up of SSO, stigma, style, and ovary. While the petals, of course, is used as as attractant to pollinators, while sepals is just there to support other floral parts, so to say. All right. Now, let me say at this point that these four options, A, B, C, and D, are the four major parts a flower has, really. This is a complete, we call it wall. We can call it the wall. W-O-R, sorry. Wall is spelled like this. Walls. Like the part of a flower, so to say. The gland that is found just below the hypothalamus is the... Mm, pituitary gland. The answer is C. Let me show you what that looks like, please, quickly. So this is the hypothalamus. Below it, any time, any day, you have your pituitary gland. So let me show it here again. Sorry. Excuse me, I'm trying to get these two. Okay. Now, so this is, like I told you here, this is the hypothalamus there and below it below it is your pituitary gland which has anterior part posterior part sorry and anterior part the anterior part secretes six hormones while the posterior part secretes two hormones well let me quickly say it here those six hormones are growth hormone luteinizing hormone um prolactin thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, mm, then uh, follicle stimulating hormone. All right. So this um, FSH and LH, so them are called gonadotropin because they work on gonads anyways. They are called gonadotropin. Gonadotropin. Sorry, I, that's going to be rough there. That space is small. Why the posterior pituitary gland secret two hormones? What are those two hormones? Oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. So you might want to rewind the video to hear those things again if you have to, please. The most important plant hormone is oxygen. Why? That's what we make the plant to grow. The gibberellin also plays some sort of role, like some sort of roles like that. But the major answer here is oxygen, which helps the plant to grow, basically. The sensory cells that respond to dim light is referred to as that would be rods, please. Let me explain some things quickly. We use cones 
let me put right here cones to see during the day and we also use it to perceive color to appreciate colors of objects why we use rods at night or dim light and we use it to appreciate let's say black and white kind of color so to say all right and i believe you know that these two are called photopigments and they are found where in the retina of the eyes so this is the retina so this retina has, it looks yellowish it's made up of cones and rods cones and rod but there's something i want you to pay attention to listen to this quickly is it there i'm trying to see if it's there okay now this area called macula means the same thing as fovea centralis or yellow spots that is the area of visual acuity where you have the sharpest image being formed this area here this way the the real i mean clear image is being formed if image is formed behind it it will be blur if it's formed in front of it it will be blur that's why people have um short or long sightedness what is wrong is that it's either image is formed in front or behind it that's what cause, causes that refractive error which you have to use a lens to correct so this area that has that is called area of visual acuity is um called area, uh, is that's where the sharpest image is formed and there's something you need to know there this area has the highest number of cones and lesser rods it doesn't mean there's no rods there there are rods there but the cones there are more than the rods so to say the another name for it is fovea centralis or yellow spot all right the absence of anti-diuretic common in humans will result into what so let's quickly remind ourselves what does ADH do. ADH helps to regulate the amount of water in the body. Let me explain what happens to you. The moment the body notices that the amount of water in your blood or your plasma is low than it should, it should be, what the body does is it's going to send out ADH from the pituitary gland. Where will it go to? It's going straight to the nephron. What will it do there? What's going to do there is make sure that the amount, because what happens really is that once blood has been filtered it is filtered into this place like that and it's moving like that now as water is moving like that not water sorry glomerular free trade is moving like that if the body notices that the amount of water in the plasma is too low adh will make sure that the the fluid inside this nephron most of it will be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream to absorb into these veins you are seeing there the reason is because if you just urinate out everything because this thing is going to the bladder if you just urinate out everything that was filtered from the blood it can end up becoming dehydrated and end up dying but nature has made it so perfect that once the instead of it to pass out amount of urine that is too much rather reduce the amount of urine let's conserve some water for the body so there's a law I, I i made up which is the more the adh the lesser the urine and the lesser the adh and the more the urine so anytime you you pass out a large amount of urine you should just know that the num the amount of adh in your system is low by the time you pass out a small amount of urine that is skunk, it could be yellowish or it might not be, but most of it's always going to be yellowish. It means that your amount of ADH is high. So ADH goes up, your urine extraction removal goes down like that. All right, this is very important. So from my explanation, you should be able to know what the answer will be. So it says absence of ADH as a direct hormone in humans results in, into what? increasing dehydration the person will end up dying in no time because you end up passing out a lot of, a large amount of urine which you don't want to do that all right estrogen is a hormone that is synthesized in females and where are females which of these ones here do you think is present in females that would be ovaries all right it's secreted in the female ovary so it is secreted in the ovary here now let me say something please i always like to do this for the sake of um impacting knowledge actually what really secretes estrogen is not 
the ovary itself rather this guy called follicle in the ovary so this is the ovary but the structure this is the follicle so the cells the follicular cells are the ones that actually secrete estrogen however because the follicular cells are inside the ovary we can pick that but i'm saying this emphatically if for example in this option you have ovary there and you see you also have follicles there please go ahead and choose follicle because the actual site is the follicle not the ovary but as it is here the best option is still ovary all right the eye defects caused by the development of cloudy areas in the lenses that's um cataract cataract uh okay now let me explain something okay press biopia means all sightedness when the muscles of the eyes become weaker so ability to focus becomes a bit um faulty i mean it becomes um, questionable glaucoma is when you have intraocular pressure when there's too much of fluid being produced in the eye so it causes some sort of bulging which it cares not taking actually lead to blindness while astigmatism means when you have uneven shape of the um, cornea so so to say all right so let me show you what um so this is what and cataract looks like so this is a normal person so i want to look at the um iris here this this black part that's a normal person but for somebody that is having cataract see it becomes cloudy you can see sorry you can, you can see it becomes whitish and cloudy instead of being dark as it were all right so in the reality this is what it looks like in someone i think i added the picture of someone there yes this is what it looks like here so that's the iris there has been it becomes cloudy from within anyways all right a pollutant that is biodegradable when you hear the word biodegradable it means that can decay that can get spoiled so to say is sewage and sewage is made up of fecal matter water and all of those things together from homes so that's so of course you know fecal matter and dirt and all of this from homes i mean can decay food substances can also decay that can also form part of sewage sewage that's what you, you see that is being passed out all right but crude oil cannot decay heavy metals cannot decay cellophane bags cannot decay so those are called by a non degradable substance so to say a tropical disease caused by trypanosoma is that causes our uh, sleeping sickness and size a sleeping sickness and it's caused the vector now listen the pathogen is trypanosoma the vector that carries this this um uh, pathogen is sese fly it's spelled this way t s e t s e sese fly that's the name of the fly that passes or drops out um uh trypanosome which will lead to trypanosomiasis which is sleepy sickness as it were the solid parts of the ecosystem is referred to as uh, solid part of the ecosystem that should be lithosphere so an ecosystem is made up of of i mean the the, the it's made up of um, what we call the biosphere and the biosphere is now divided into lithosphere hydrosphere and atmosphere so this is solid parts i think i have a diagram that should be able to show us what that looks like so this is what we're seeing here so this is the atmosphere which is the gaseous aspect of the ecosystem of the biosphere like everywhere we have life the hydrosphere is the water part then lithosphere is the hard part so to say all right which of the following is called is caused by tre treponema pallidum that is syphilis Syphilis is, is an STD that's caused by treponema pallidum. White tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, while leprosy is caused by mycobacterium leprae, while gonorrhea is caused by um, Neisseria gonorrhea. Those are the pathogens that causes each of these other diseases. All right. So, which blood group do universal recipient belong that means they can receive blood from everybody and that blood group is blood group ab why can how can they do that 
How can they do that? The reason is because, let me start from here. Blood group AB here have um, antigens, but don't have, sorry, have, yes, but don't have antibody. And there's a law that I need you to remember. Let me do that quickly here now. If this is a donor here, this is a recipient here. So the recipient, this is what happens. This is the donor's blood. This recipient's blood. Normally, what happens is, um, I need you to remember these things here. I think if you can watch my video on 2000 and maybe maybe 11 or 12 or so, I explained this. One of the years I've done anyways, I've explained this and I also have lecture on this. Now, if somebody is blood group, let me put this way. Let me show you the reason why somebody that's blood group A, B can receive blood from everybody. Let's say, now, this, this person is blood group A. Uh, if you have blood group A, you are going to have antigen A outside, you are going to have antibody B inside, like in your plasma, that's what it means. Now, if you have blood group A, B, so this person is blood group A, B, that wants to receive blood from blood group A person. This person is blood group A, this is blood group A, B, I want to receive the blood. The one below the line here, this person down here, the line, is the recipient. Now, okay, I already put the R there. What happened is, for if you have blood group AB, you are going to have antigen A and antigen B. It's a law. Now, the, the law is that if you have antigen, a particular antigen, you are not meant to have the antibody in your plasma. That's why this person has blood group A. Only has antibody B. He can't have antibody A. It doesn't work that way. So if somebody is having antibody A and B, that means he doesn't have anything here. So it doesn't have any antibody at all. That's why it says here. It says, if you look at this line down here, this, this column here, it says antibody present none for blood group A B. So what happened is this. I mean it's reality. When you so when you give somebody when a person donates the blood, the antigen of the person, which is now, this person is blood group A, is a, his or antigen goes like that and goes to look at the plasma of this person. And when he goes there, he didn't see anything. So for that reason, this person can receive blood from anybody because even if I were to put blood group B person here that has blood, which is going to have antigen B and antibody A, and I want to give the same, this person wants to give his blood to this same individual, what happens is the same thing. The antigen goes like that and looks at the plasma, there's nothing there. So that's the reason why blood group A, B can receive blood from everybody. This is very, very important. So if you look at this chart here, so these are the recipients here. So, uh, okay, these are the, the donor goes down like this, recipient goes this way. So this person here is blood group A, B, I can receive blood from O, from A, from B, from A, B itself. All right, this is very important. Where blood group O can donate to, to O, A, B, and A, B. Please do check my other, I can't remember the name of the, the year where I treated, I explained this the more. And I also have a lecture on this, please. All right. The clumping together of red blood cell is called agglutination. Well, this question is just like what we just finished solving now. Now, the, the, the point is, if, for example, let me give you an example I'm trying to say. From just what I just explained now, the donor is up here, the recipient is down here. So let me say, this person is blood group A, which has antigen A outside and antibody B inside. And this person is blood group B, which has antigen B outside and has antibody A inside. This will happen, like I told you, the donor's antigen will go in and look, wow, there's also A there. For the fact that it's antigen A meeting with antibody A, that will lead to serious problem. The blood will clump. That's called agglutination, which means like the red blood cell, sorry, which means the red, which means the red blood cell is rupturing, so to say. And that is why people always do cross matching before giving anybody doing blood transfusion because it can claim or it has always claimed life if, if you don't if you don't give the right blood group to, to someone. All right.
physiological adaptation to very dry conditions in animals demonstrates estivation. When an animal is trying to overcome dry season, that's called estivation. And that is what you are seeing here in this snail here. So this so for this organism, this snail to overcome the season of dryness for a period of time, it's formed that sort of shield over its surface. As it's going to be like that, it's not dead, but it's going to be inactive for that period of time. All right. So while for to over, uh, overcome cold. Um, for a dry condition, uh, a cold condition, that one is called hibernation, which is not part of what we are meant to do anyways. I just explained that. So, you might pause the video here to read what this means. So, it says here that um, um, estivation, it says it refers to a state in activity in ectotherms that occurs during extreme warm temperature. All right. So, just read what is here. It's something self-explanatory. All right. One of adaptations of cactus opuntia to conserve water is the reduction of leaves to spine. We've done that in the same this same year. So you have something like this. So instead of having leaves, you have spines. And I told you why. Because the more leaves you have, the more stomata you have. And the more stomata you have, the more you will lose water, so to say. Like humans, we breathe through our nostrils and some air, well, sorry, what, what's it called? Water vapor comes out. So imagine you have noses, you have noses like all around our body. You're going to end up losing a lot of water. So the, one of the adaptations is the fact that it has leaves that has been reduced to spine to conserve water. Which of the following structure is adapted for feeding? in a bird of prey oh which means it helps a bird to feed on prey okay that would be hooked beak and sharp claws smooth beak is wrong strong no big beak no pointy beak no the answer is a we had this not quite long i hope you can be able to get this as well yes this was what we talked about it's going to be hooked beak which we have here like that. That's a hooked beak, like an eagle, and sharp claws to be able to seize the prey. And the beak is to be able to tear the meat of the prey. The special pigment for, for color change in chameleon is, this is a chameleon that has all sorts of colors. They can assume all sorts of color, but they have a structure called, a pigment called chromatophore, which helps them to change color to it's 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 a it's a nature that has helped them to that will make them to remain undetected in their habitats and they can easily just camouflage and be able to catch its prey there like that all right the behavior adaptation in social insects could best be described as the question is what are social insects anyways social insects are all insects that have the in which Different members of the same of the, of that colony performs different functions. In fact, some of them are so different that their structure suits what they are doing. Like in in the case system of termites, the soldier literally has a big head that has uh, what's it called um, jaws to to fight. While the worker is meant to only work, the, the, the queen is meant to only produce eggs and, 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 and that. So examples of social insects are ants, bees, wasp, and termites. They work in group majorly. That's one major thing. Aside from the fact that they, they have division of labor, they work in groups and all of that. So working together, we can call that uh, symbiosis. Mm, yes. Like together, like organisms living together, even though that doesn't, that doesn't really, that's the best answer I can pick from here, sincerely. You can't say commensalism because it's all of them are benefiting from each other. Of which you know, the symbiosis just means organism being together, really. The real thing that we, which means two organisms are benefiting is called mutualism. Let me say this here if you have seen my other videos, you know what I'm trying to say. Symbiosis simply means organism living together, it's that divided into mutualism which means two organisms are benefiting we call that plus and plus or parasitism which means 
plus and minus. The parasite is gaining, the host is losing, that's the minus. Then we have what we call commensalism, which means one is gaining, the other one is not gaining or losing, plus and zero. All right. So this is actually, symbiosis simply means togetherness. We doesn't talk about whether one is benefiting or one is losing. But in this option, the best option there will be symbiosis. All right. In the diagram, the structure label two is the chite. Now, no, not chite, sorry. That's clitellum. This solemn part is called clitellum, which is going to be, that's where the eggs will be, in a fluid called cocoon. So this cocoon is a fluid that holds the egg, egg, egg in place, please. All right. So the the answer to that is clitellum. Three should be the chite, like, what we mean chite is like some sort of um, impression, like air-like structure, like that, which is like that. Most of them are present in... Um, in um, roundworms, like segmented roundworms, like ragworms, uh, earthworm, and the like. So the answer to this is clitellum. Let me see if I have a diagram there. Okay, I think I do have a diagram. Okay, so this is the clitellum, like I told you here. That's the solemn part. Then all these black back, those black dots like that along the length are called. Some books will call it setai. Some will call it chitei. It means the same thing. All right. So here you might want to, yes, this is nice. I was going to, someone once asked me this question. I think I should answer it here now. He said that um, are um, earthworm hermaphrodites or they are not. They are actually hermaphrodites really, or let me say they are, yes, they have uh, male genitals and female genitals on the same organism. However, there's a problem. The problem is that they cannot fertilize this one single earthworm cannot self-reproduce so it needs the help of another one if you have seen my lecture on reproduction you get this the point is what it does is um so this is earthworm one this is earthworm two so what happened is let's say this is earthworm it has over here it has testes here this is earthworm two so they will now turn upside, I mean, they will lie in opposite direction to each other, such that the, this one will now put its testes here, and this one will put its ovary here, which means this one will shed sperm to the ovary here, and this will shed sperm to the ovary here. So they still need help of each other. So that means this one will give this one the sperm cell, this one will give this one the sperm cell. They both have the ovary. Do you get, get my point? So the point is, they, 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 they are not so developed to the extent whereby the sperm can just swim like this to the ovary. No. Or to the eggs, no. But they need, so we call them some sort of monoecious. Monoecious means it has two type of, uh, it has both sexes on the same organism at the same time. I mean, the same organism, it has the male and female genital, or male and female gonad on the same organism. All right, so it can't carry out self uh, fertilization because of the way it is positioned. That's why it still needs to, it, it needs to become, they need to come together. All right. Now, the organism is found in soil rich in um, humus. Yes, they love rich, organically rich soil, so to say, that is rich in humus. They prefer to stay there. All right, that's earthworm, and it helps to also aerate the soil. It is of a great economic importance in farming. All right. All right, that will be all for now. So I'm going to see you in the next past question 2014.